Hello and welcome to Brooks TV. I'm Oscar Brighton. And I'm Alumni Mancouli. Coming up in this week's episode, we take a look at the covered market planned up facelift. Is there anything we could do to help these crocodiles? And we catch up with the participants of the Oxford Swing Festival. With the prices. With the prices increasing throughout the UK, it's becoming harder for people to stop uh, shop like they used to. Over 54% of people in England say that they've been forced to cut back on their food spending. Bryony Scott reports. Over the past three years, the Hennington market has become a pillar of the local community, allowing independent businesses a place to sell and engage with customers. There's a wide variety of stalls, from bakers and butchers to florists and woodworkers. Although alongside the period of running, the country's cost of living crisis has developed and impacted all elements within businesses, productions and sales. October 2022 saw record-breaking inflation rates, peaking at 11.1%. This rate has since fallen slightly to 10.7% in November and 105 in December, but continues to have an impact on all elements of the economy. As a result of these unexpected costs and decreased incomes, it's meant many smaller shops and businesses have been forced to close. I spoke to one of the organisers to learn more about the market and how they've been affected by the cost of living crisis. It's a good, busy Oxford market, basically. I think there's definitely this year has been a little bit of a, a drop in the sales from the stalls. Um, so I, I have a stall on the market so I can see the custom numbers have come down a little bit and the sales have maybe come down about 5%. Definitely you get the feeling that people are doing this kind of, do I need it? Do I want it or do I need it? And some of the dearer priced items, they're kind of thinking, oh, I'll leave it till next week, I'll leave it till next week. Yeah, definitely seems to be a little bit quieter than I've experienced it previously. The town is, people are very kind, very polite. And of course, the market is really good here for Saturday and it's a half a day as well to finish. So that's the best things, you know, for us. Disposable income, they're not spending on, on plants. Despite the decrease in customer footfall and sales, it is clear that the market continues to strive through community and positivity. Bryony Scott, Brooks, TV News. Formula Student is the most established engineering competition in Europe. Laurie Adioy visits Oxford Brooks Racing down at Wheatley campus to find out more about how their team is preparing for this year's event. Last year, Oxford Brooks Racing announced that they were launching their first ever all-hybrid electric racing car to compete in Formula Student 2022 in July. Formula Student is the largest motorsport competition in England where teams from universities around the world compete to build their own single-seat race cars. They are judged on speed, acceleration and endurance. The Oxford Brooks Racing team have collected seven UK top team awards more than any other university since 1989, breaking records and barriers building their cars from scratch. More than 350 students from around the world entered to take part in building the Brooks electric car and installing the battery starting from September 2021. This was the first time all students were working on the car in person since 2019. Students said that the difference between working on an electric car versus an old traditional racing car was a broad jump. What may seem complicated is actually pretty easy. You mean, it, it, I mean it's, you put a motorcycle engine realistically in the back of a car, it already has a built-in gearbox and you really just put some fuel in it, make sure it gets some air and it, it just goes bang and it goes. It's very, it's, it's very straightforward. Electric vehicles are a lot more complicated, that's why it's taken us so long to really get to the stage. This year, the team has started working on the next car for this year's competition. It's been confirmed that it will be electric and having a win for the team will mean a lot to them. Developing an electric car is a very, very big challenge and it looks like we might have it sorted, this, sorted out this year. So if we go ahead and we win, it'll mean everything for me and especially for the team, the people who've been here for the past three years working extremely hard on the car. The Oxford Brooks Racing Team didn't win the competition overall last year but they were able to win engineering design and lab time simulation. And now with this year's competition happening again at Silverstone on July 19th, Oxford Brooks Racing Team are aiming to come out to become the winners and add another top team award to their diary. Laurie Adeoye, Brooks TV News. The team's looking good. Got high hopes for them next year. 
A local gem known as the Covered Market is going to be having a makeover. Dylan Palmer Turpin has this to report. Here in the heart of Oxford city centre is the historic Covered Market. Dating back to the 1770s and famous for being one of the oldest continually operating markets in the country, Oxford City Council has recently approved a £6.87 million package to revitalise the Covered Market. A set of proposals have been prepared over a two-year period involving extensive consultation with market traders, residents and other stakeholders. There are three areas of improvement planned. Pedestrian friendly market street, new communal space and improved entrances. Planters, seating and outdoor stores are to be introduced to market street allowing a more visible opening to the market. This new and improved entrance will feature a large seating area doubling up as a public square during the day and a flexible event space at other times. The public toilets will be modernised and relocated. The back entrance to the market will be transformed into an attractive, relaxing green space. Sympathetic architectural changes such as the addition of glazing will allow much more light into the market. The developers promise the regeneration will respect the unique character, heritage and history of the covered market. Oh, I think it's going to be great. I really think it's going to be great. It'll increase footfall. Um, you'll have a lot more people coming in and out. It's going to make it feel a lot more breezy. It'll be a lot more like Tooting or Brixton, one of those London markets. I think it, yeah, it will work really well. Fortunately, no council representatives were available for interview, but councillor Susan Brown, leader of Oxford City Council, has issued the following statement. This is a large sum of money, but it's a necessary spend in order to safeguard the future of one of the city's most unique features. This is an investment in the city's economy as well as one of its assets. This multi-million pound investment is the beginning of a new chapter for this historic covered market here in Oxford. This is Dylan Palmer Turpin for Brooks TV News. It seems that every day another animal becomes endangered in the wild, crocodiles being one of them. Foster Holt visited the UK's only crocodile zoo to tell us what they do and how we can help out. Crocodiles are some of the most endangered species in the world, so I decided to find out more about a zoo committed to their conservation. I'm here at Crocodiles of the World, a specialised zoo which focuses on educating people and clearing up any misconceptions they might have about crocodiles. Some of the most endangered species of crocodiles can be found here, including the Chinese alligator, of which there are only around 120 left in the wild. Live feedings are a daily occurrence, and these flashy shows of teeth help inspire young minds to get more involved with an exciting world outside what they're familiar with. Some of the species, the Philippine crocodile, Komodo dragon, the Galapagos tortoises, We've got ongoing programs for, for all of those uh, species and there's colleagues of ours that we will support either financially or with um, well any support that they want. Sometimes it's just contact, sometimes it's in country, uh, stuff that we may be able to arrange for them. Um, yeah, we, we, we give them that, that support because they're working for a particular species that has largely been forgotten. So. Uh, we, we do what we can in that regard. So it's not just financial, it's, uh, it's in expertise, contacts, links. We also asked some of the visitors what they thought about crocodiles and whether it should be up to us to help them out. No, we, we're the reasons they're declining, we're the reasons that yeah. they should be getting better. We encroach on their space and yeah. we can at least give them a place like this to then thrive a bit more. Yeah, that. exactly. Of the 24 species of crocodilian, seven are currently listed as critically endangered Four is vulnerable and 12 is least risk. It's clear that these species are in trouble, but luckily places like this are around to support conservation efforts and people can help out simply by engaging with those involved. We do definitely have loads of loyal visitors that really love to yeah, keep coming back and keeping up to date with the kind of work that we're doing here. So yeah, especially being a little kind of hidden gem that we are, not necessarily that many people around the country know about us, even in the local area. So. We want everyone to come in and yeah, really kind of appreciate and learn from the message we're trying to send about supporting the crocs of the world. The dangerously low numbers of some of these species are pushing conservationists to support new ways of ensuring these magnificent animals aren't lost. Foster Holt, Brooks TV News. The Swing Festival returned to Oxford this year. Oscar Brighton reports on how this dance event entices its audience. The Oxford Town Hall a building rich in atmosphere and history. But tonight, swing music. From vintage clothing to lively beats, the Oxford Swing Festival is a feast for the senses. Swing enthusiasts from all over the country gather here to share their love of this iconic dance style. 
This evening, the festival kicks off with an opening party featuring live music from top swing bands across the country. I caught up with two of the organisers of the Oxford Swing Festival. The original version of this festival ran in 2014. Uh, and back then it was a lot smaller than it is now. It was not in the town hall. It was mainly in the East Oxford Community Center and the East Oxford Primary School and the then existent Deaf Center. So that was sort of our venues. And we had like a, maybe, I don't know, 100 to 120 people over the weekend. Now we have up to 350. So it's been like less than half. A big part of it is the people that we invite to come. So the teachers that we invite, the people who come to play music, the bands, but the bands, a big part yeah. of it as well are, is this the community of, of local volunteers and other dancers who kind of come together to put this festival together. So we're yeah. all volunteers, all of us have day jobs and we do other things. All of us coming together because we have a passion about dancing and we really want to bring this kind of vibrant, um, sort of cultural um, legacy community, of swing dancing yeah. and community to Oxford yeah. um, because also Oxford itself has a big history in many different levels so this adding sort of swing dancing and, and also bringing the community together for it. Beyond the dance floor the festival offers plenty of opportunities for socialising and relaxation. Attendees can indulge in drinks and soak up the lively atmosphere. I spoke with some of the patrons there. My favourite part of the festival yeah is uh, the learning part of it because uh, we do social dances in the evening but in the day we, we do lessons and you get to learn lots of deep uh, techniques there and it's, that's the most interesting part for me. Overall the Oxford Swing Festival is a must attend event for swing lovers everywhere. Don't miss out on the chance to experience this unique celebration of music and dance. This has been Oscar Brighton for Brooks TV News. That's it for this half but still to come we find out why 60,000 IFI residents signed a petition to protect local badges. And we check out what went on at the Oxford Brooks Science Bazaar. Hello and welcome back to Brooks TV News. I'm now joined by Lucy Turner, the coordinator of Oxford Brooks Creative. Lucy, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you very much for coming to the studio today. You're welcome. My first question is concerning placement. One of the aspects of Brooks Creative is placement support, with helping students get placements. What would you say is the success rate of students gaining a placement year? Um, well, this is the first year that we've, Brooks Creative, have, have been involved in any sort of placement opportunities with Brooks. Um, and at the moment, it's very difficult in terms of communicating to students the earliness of, with which they need to apply for placements, because quite a lot of the big opportunities come in the first semester quite early um, and at that point we had no interest it wasn't until about Christmas um, when students came forward um, and by that point quite a lot of the opportunities are being taken up already and they're also very popular opportunities and that the only placement really that has been embedded in a program is digital media production um, the other students in the other programs aren't necessarily necessarily on board with it because it was never an option for them when they first started their programme. So it's all quite new. Um, so at the moment we've got a publishing student who is just finalising some points with their uh, placement provider. But at the moment I don't feel like we are at a stage where we have been able to properly support students in terms of uh, securing their placement. Not that it's our responsibility to do that, but um, I would like to have been able to have enabled that a lot, a lot earlier. Of course. Whilst placements are often seen as very valuable experiences to have, what are some potential downsides that could come from during the placement year, during the placement process, and even after, after the placement, integrating students back into the social life of university? Yeah, I think, I think the benefits of the placement far outweigh the negative um, um, aspects of it, but sometimes students could feel um, a little bit isolated depending on where they've gone to do their placement and obviously they've got to find accommodation when they're on their placement. So those sorts of things can also be quite difficult um, to help them organise. Um, then there might be some aspects of their actual work um, with their employer which could be tricky. It could be that um, the employer hasn't uh, got the funding then to continue employing the placement student. So obviously that is also a negative side. But that is very rare and so the students actually come back from a placement normally very professional with a much 
more um, focused attitude towards their, their final year um, and integrating back into a cohort that they didn't start with. Um, that can sometimes be tricky, but with the level of um, in professionalism they've just experienced over the last 12 months, they settle in very quickly and very well normally. Just So you said in the first answer that you have only been in placement support for about a year. Have you had any negative experiences with media companies as far as trying to get student placements? Have you had any difficult clients? No, not really. I think what the problem, the problem I find when I'm trying to negotiate placements is that um, they, they don't necessarily, those that don't run the big placement um, opportunities with and they haven't got a structure in place within their company, they don't necessarily know how to support a placement student. <clears throat> so a placement student is essentially still So sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off right there. Thank okay. you very much for coming in. Nearly 60,000 people have signed a petition to prevent housing development in Ifley Meadows, Oxfordshire, which campaigners say will pose a huge threat to protected wildlife. Alex Frakovich reports. A local wildlife group have hit out of Oxford Council's so-called scandalous housing plans to develop an ancient meadow in Ifley, home to a number of rare wildlife habitats. The Oxfordshire Badger Group are particularly worried about the detrimental effects that Ox Place's development proposals will have on the well-being of the local badger community. It will be incredibly destructive at a time when we know we have an emergency um, of our natural world. Um, these meadows here represent two and a half acres of ancient habitat, both meadows and hedgerows and ditches, and together they support a great abundance of wildlife. We've got rare bats and birds and a white badger called Luna, who's part of a really extensive set that live um, just bordering the meadows here. This nighttime footage provided by Oxford Badger Group shows Luna, the rare white badger, collecting hay to line her set. The council states that the proposed development in Ifley is necessary to provide more affordable housing within Oxford and that housing costs mean that nearly a third of the city's children live below the poverty line. We are very much in favour of affordable housing in Oxford. There's a great need and we know that there are lots of um, alternative sites. In addition, there's another site just 300 metres away from the horse fields here. It is a greenfield site, but it's much, much less damaging. Um, it used to be a, um, a playing field. It's allocated already for 84 homes. We'd like the whole site to be fully affordable and that way they could take the quantities, the 32 homes, that are planned here just 300 metres away. There have been more than 1,000 objections to the planning application from people who value the quiet space for walking, cycling and other leisure activities. It would save this quiet route and all the benefits people get from being close to nature, but also preserving the wildlife here means that um, we can uh, be much better prepared for uh, global heating, for the climate and biodiversity emergencies. The Oxford Badger Group also hoped that Ifley Fields will help education for local schools as it is only a 15 minute walk away. They argue that it would greatly impact the well-being of children post-Covid. All in all, we feel it meets a different need, not the need for housing, but the need for nature, the need for children, the need for um, education and well-being. Alex Frakovich, Brooks TV News. Those poor badgers. I hope that petition does them some good. It's the British Science Week and the Science Bazaar returns to Oxford Brooks to answer some scientific questions like what's the most effective way for children to learn about science? Anna Rosolowska has found the perfect solution. This is the 14th Science Bazaar organised by Oxford Brooks University. The aim of the bazaar is to spark interest for science in children from the local community. One of the most popular attractions today is Tony the Crocodile. Tell me one interesting fact about Tony. Um, Tony's about two and a half years old. Uh, we, we bring him along uh, because he's a good size, so he looks all right to the, to the little kiddies. Um, and he allows us to explain a few basic facts about crocodiles to the, to the kids. But why is it important to participate in an event like that? We've spoken to one of the organisers to find out. Seeing people. So seeing researchers, seeing scientists and being able to relate to them, um, that's invaluable. Without having that personal connection, you, you don't know you could do that. Having that one-to-one that -one with someone 
and, and then learning from them and getting their enthusiasm, you get excited about it. So I think that's why it's important. According to one study, 55% of children aged 11 to 14 said that practical work is a great motivation to learn science. Mm, I like it because I learn more stuff. I love making words. I learn about uh, more of the structure of bones. The organizers aim is also to expand the reach of the event. Uh, I piloted a relaxed, autism-friendly early opening. Um, these events are traditionally very busy, very noisy, very scary environments for those that are neurodiverse. Um, and so having a time when it's a lot quieter, there's less people here, um, there's more freedom to roam at their own pace, I, that was so important for me. The number of families that came to the event shows that there is interest in encouraging children to learn about science through practical activities. Events like the Science Bazaar can make the STEM subjects more fun and approachable. The hope is that there will be more events like this to encourage children in studying science. Anna Rosolowska for Brooks TV News. Wow, I always loved science as a kid. I wish I could have gone to the bazaar back then, but anyway. Now, let's take a look at the Varsity Sports Festival. The historic rivalry rages on between the two universities. Olumbe Munkuli reports. Coverage of the Oxford Brooks versus Reading University Sports Festival. This year marks the 10th, 10 year anniversary of this intense competition between these two great universities. Going through the facility, we were able to see that there are students watching our student athletes train and prep themselves so we decided to ask them how they are feeling uh, well of course it's got to be just like high level of gameplay from like across all sports you know it's, it makes it exciting there's a reason it's varsity it's not just you know any old game it's the best on the best kind of thing um, so it'd be obviously high level gameplay close i think that's what makes it probably one of the best aspects is like it's very close um, and just like an overall like good environment, everyone just comes to support whether you're into the sport specifically or not. Everyone just comes along because it is just exciting, you know. So that's how kind of the atmosphere I guess I expect. As many students are preparing for this varsity and this momentous event to keep their title, we are here to speak with Omar. Uh, so my preparation starts weeks before the game. It starts with uh visualizing 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 myself on the field making plays it's starting with a physical preparation at the gym on the field uh to know what i do to know it best it's mental preparation to know my opponent to know what they do to know uh what plays their uh their favorite to know uh, what side on the field they like to go as much and to know who I'm coming up against. Speak to Marcus, who is the head of all student athletes and is currently running the sports varsity. This is his first year and he is going to be telling us how he's running it with his team. Teams, we have four men's football teams, etc. etc. Is there a way that that should be the priority and we take, we have more students taking part in the day and actually, therefore, the outcome kind of becomes secondary? Or is it that every single first team plays at a level and we try to win and maximise? That's kind of still um, up in the air as to, as to what the overarching rationale is. So if we go back to the last question of yeah. how do we make the it's student athletes telling us what varsity is. This has been Alumri Munkuli for Bricks TV News. That's it for this episode. So thank you for watching. You can watch all of our previous episodes on the Oxford Brooks YouTube channel. Yes, and please don't hesitate to get in touch by emailing brookstv at brooks.ac.uk as we'd love to hear from you about new stories you think we should be covering. Thanks for watching.